coming across well with the audio and everything. I'm just manning this one myself, no backup plan, so uh, uh, no backup staff. So hopefully I uh, will run smoothly with no issues. So this is my webinar on personality and branding in the social media age. And this is really something that we can talk about for a long, long time. But we're going to, going to do sort of the highlights version here. Um, and uh, just as before, uh, there's a question space probably right there-ish or so. Um, and I'll, I've got a screen open, so I'll try to catch those as they come in. Um, I apologize for the lighting. I actually set this up uh, earlier in the day. And now that it's dark here, um, we have a very kind of creepy voodoo thing going on with the, um, uh, the lighting here. So I've experimented a little bit. Um, and I apologize for that. So hopefully we'll we'll be spending a lot of time with the deck anyway, slide deck. So um, I'm actually gonna push right over to that slide deck now. And in theory, you can all see that. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, just kind of address, uh, first off, what branding is and, uh, and why professionalism is going to matter as we're presenting ourselves. So the idea here is that if I have a, I have a desperate need for a doctor and I need one of these one of these two to treat me and realistically David Tennant isn't going to be available so I have to choose between these two one of these looks a whole lot more trustworthy than the other um, just for the record the guy on the left is a friend of mine um, and you know that so I'm not making fun of anyone who uh, this is not somebody legitimate person trying to make a, uh, a good living here but the idea here is you know the one on the right presents a very professional attitude. Um, we don't have a lot of background. Uh, we don't know where he is, but we know he's not in an inappropriate setting like the one on the left is. Um, he just He's put together more, much more neatly. He's carrying the correct tools of the trade. He has a medical file folder as opposed to a cigarette. Uh, so there's a lot of things there that are you know fairly subtle that you know you can say, well, they're both wearing lab coats, but really that's not that's not what's going to make the difference here. And so there's a lot of subtle things that go into presentation and branding. And it's the subtleties that I want to talk about. Um, obviously, there are huge things as well, but we can think about the subtleties. We're asking people to spend their time. We're asking people to spend their money. And in many cases, especially if you write kid lit, we're asking them to trust us with their family. So we need to appear trustworthy. We need to appear professional. And realistically, most of us are writing fiction. Uh, we also need to appear fun because that's why they're with us for their leisure time. So uh, this is the key to all branding. You are your brand and you control your brand. Um, these sentences are pretty simple, but they're, they're, they're everything there is to know. If you have this, you can use this as a guide for all of your marketing efforts. And especially when we're talking about internet marketing, which um, most of us don't have you know, enormous personal networks uh, in our own neighborhoods. So we need the internet marketing. Uh, think about, okay, would you say this to my face? Is this the brand that you want to present? Because you are your brand. There is no separation. So uh, if, if you, would you say this at a party, then why would you say this online kind of thing? So disclaimer, uh, as we go forward, um, I'm going to use a lot of examples from my own personal marketing uh, in here. This is not because I am the best at marketing and you should all do exactly what I do. It's going to be because I can tell you what I'm doing and I can tell you what's working and what's not working. And I have permission to make fun of myself, which I will not do to other people. Uh, so this is not me just giving myself the big high five, like my handy little GIF here suggests. Um, this is so we can talk about concepts. And the big thing about this is these are concepts, not recipes. So if I, if I point out something that seems to be working well for me or for someone else, don't take that and do exactly what that is take the concept behind it and apply it to your situation because you probably wrote a slightly different book and it's not going to work if you just lift in, you know, copy paste is not how marketing works or everybody would be a bestseller at all the time. <laughs> okay. We need to customize to our own situations. So the first thing that comes up a lot is, wait a minute, what is my brand? Um, and I don't know if, if you've written those books that are kind of across the genre and you have to, uh, you have to pick a genre. Um, Making a brand sounds, you know, even even more difficult. So let's talk a little bit, and I'll, and I'll be honest. Um, I I published my first self-published book in 2012. Uh, in the summer of 2016, I nailed down my brand. Okay, so this is not something that comes easily to everyone, and it's not something that. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's not simple. Now, it's harder for me because I'm, I'm very bad at this because I publish in multiple genres. If you stick with one genre, you can probably get there a lot faster. So, so let's talk a little bit about a sample. Um, oh, my voice is echoing a little bit. I'm sorry, I didn't see that before. Um, let me see if I can. If I'm still echoing, somebody tell me that in the um, in the com in the question section. And if it's better, somebody tell me that in the question section, please. Okay. So as a sample, um, if I'm writing a series, a mystery series uh, with protagonists that are driving across the U.S. and they're just going to be photographing photographing various uh, historical sites and all this sort of thing, that would be um, maybe that's the premise of the of the thing I'm doing. Um, there's a lot in there that I can pull out to use for marketing, um, but that's not really my brand yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I know my genre, it's mystery, okay? Um, but there's a lot of subgenres, so I need to look at. There's a thriller, there's a cozy, there's procedural, there's a lot of subgenres. Sub and I need to figure out which of those subgenres does my mystery fall into, um, because readers of one are not necessarily readers of another. And if I sell to, you know, a, re a mystery reader who loves cozies and gets a procedural, uh, that person might leave an unhappy review because it's not what they want. But then we can start getting into actual, you know, what are the themes of this? And this is where you start to get your brand. Um, so empowerment, is this a voyage of self-discovery? Are we going and connecting with family through each story? You know, what, what are, and I think um, for most of us, Finding what your themes are, finding those recurring themes in your work helps to nail down the brand. That's what, it, um, what really worked out for me. And I, like I said, I, I experimented for a long time. And it wasn't until this summer that I felt like I really nailed. Okay, this is what I need. To, this is what I need to sell myself as. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but we have a lot of things we can still be working with. Those are road trips, um, photography, historic sites, and right there, that's an infinite amount of information to blog about. So you will never have a shortage of material and content for your blogs and your tweets and all the things that we'll be talking about. And then I can also focus on those themes that are going to become my brand. And, um, oh, I'm still echoing. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know. I've got all the volumes turned down. Um, maybe I'll try to eat the microphone. I'm, I'm really sorry. Bear with me. So um, I'm going to pick with those, uh, pick from those themes and try to pull out my brand. So for me, what I have discovered um, in my when I started looking at my body of work as a whole uh, is that I have a consistent theme of characters making choices about their lives um, and improving their lives through their own choices. Um, that sounds really vague. <laughs> so um, what am I trying to say here? Um, if I have I have characters in impossible situations, and it would be very logical for people to give up. Uh, you know, to just feel like these are things, these are bad things that happen to me, and, and it's beyond its fate, it's beyond my reach to do anything about. But you choose to do something about them anyway, uh, even if socially it's acceptable to just, you know, let it hit you in the face and go on. And um, and so that's something that I started to realize was a consistent and recurring theme in my work. It happened a lot. And um, so that turned into finally the Own Your Power uh, logo, which is across the top of my website right now. So we're not going to spend a lot of time with that, but I'm um, suggesting that if you're, if you're totally stuck on what your brand might be, it's not your genre, think about themes and, um, and go with that. So, so let's talk now about um, what we do with that. Um, you know, we've done the world's fastest branding <laughs> session. Um, let's talk about where we go. Um, 2003 called, they want their GeoCities site back. Anybody has actually seen a GeoCities site, you know this, what I'm talking about. So the same thing, I have an emergency, or I have something where I'm desperately looking for a service, and uh, I've got two options. Okay, the names are fairly similar. Okay, the, one of these websites already looks more professional than the other, but, you know, realistically, there's not a huge breakdown there. And then, oh, dear God, okay? Um, these are both actual websites. Um, the one on the right is no longer functional in business for some reason. Uh, so this is uh, this is one of those things that everybody 
pretty much has a website, but not everybody works to keep it looking professional and competitive. Your website is your single business, biggest business card. Your website is where everybody uh, will come at some point and it makes the largest impressions um, because it's where people are gonna come repeatedly. It needs to be attractive. I highly, highly recommend, um, in my mind, this is a non-negotiable, uh, that you have a responsive theme. And what that means, if I translate from the geek, a uh, responsive theme is one that automatically resizes to any uh, size or type of screen that's viewing it. So if I build my website so it looks fantastic on my large desktop computer with a huge monitor, and then somebody opens it up on their mobile phone and it's completely jumbled or the, it, the alignment makes no sense or it's got a lot of elements that are too tiny to see, uh, they're going to close that and move on. And um, right now, depending on your demographic, <clears throat> excuse me, but in some markets, about 60% of web, uh, web traffic is done via mobile rather than a large desk, desktop monitor. So you're, uh, that's 60% of people you could be losing when they open your website. So um, definitely have a responsive theme. Uh, my strong recommendation is to purchase a theme. If you're using WordPress or some other... Uh, CMS software to build your website, buy a theme. Free themes, one, are often a security risk. People don't realize that. There's a lot of backdoors built into free themes to allow them to gain access to the server to use in um, net attacks. So that's something that, uh, whether or not it's affecting you directly, it's still a risk. And two, um, if you buy a good theme, you know it's gonna be solid and you can buy a responsive theme. So I recommend that. Uh, your website needs to reflect your genre and it needs to reflect your branding. Uh, it needs to be easily navigable. If I can't find a menu and get to where I'm going, I'm gonna give up and leave. Your website needs to be regularly updated. This is for a couple of reasons. One, uh, if I come to your website, um, I'm like, oh, this looks really interesting. What is going on? And the last thing that happened is in 2008, um, which is, happens fairly often, <laughs> I'll go to old websites, um, I assume you're dead or you're not putting out new books or, or something has happened there. Um, if I don't see anything recent, I'm gonna keep going. Um, the other part of this has to do with SEO, search engine optimization. Google and other search engines, obviously Google being the behemoth, rank up, um, update uh, updates in part of their algorithm to determine where to rank, place your website. You will be more visible if you update more often. So especially if you're competing for a market that's, I don't know, um, maybe YA or something, you're using a lot of search terms to bring people in. Um, you, in order to stay competitive, you need to update fairly often. Your web date needs, the website needs to be fun and it needs to reflect your own personality. And the, you know, again, this goes back to your brand. It should have books. Um, I, honestly, I go to authors' websites where I can't find their books. Um, please make it easy to find. It goes back to navigable. Many of you will probably be blogging. That should also be easy to find. It's also a super easy way to make sure that your website is regularly updated. And uh, not least, uh, your website should have contact info. If I want to tell you that my, your book changed my life, uh, make it easy for me to do that. Um, if I want to invite you to speak at my school, make it easy for me to do that. If I want to ask you, hey, when's the sequel coming out? Make it easy for me to do that. This can be social media contacts. This is going to be an email form. Um, probably not a phone number, but I'm one of those people who doesn't like to talk on the phone. So um, match to your own personality. There are a couple of good options. Um, and I will put these links up. Um, I, I was building this also as a PDF to hand out. So um, I will put these links up elsewhere for you guys to be able to get. But if you you can also get to these um, by Googling them. HostGator, which is a hosting company, but they have a good information on building a better website. 23 reasons your website sucks. There are 23 really common reasons, so just make sure that you can check off the, the no to all of those. Author Media is a company specifically for um, writers and publishers, and they they build a lot of plugins and whatnot for websites. Um, I actually use a number of them. They're, I find they're very good. Uh, and they have seven ways author websites irritate readers. Again, run through that and make sure you can check off no with that. Um, Author Media does make and sell uh, both free and premium versions of WordPress plugins. 
Um, and they're running a couple of Kickstarters right now, which means you can get a huge bundle of all of their plugins for very cheap. So uh, I highly recommend checking them out. I believe they are at authormedia.com. And um, I, I just, again, I use a number of their plugins. I don't get any kickback from that. I've just been really happy with the way they work for me. <coughs> Here's the thing about social media is it's really easy to get caught up in a numbers game. Oh, I've got, you know, 500 people on my Facebook page and this person has 5,000. Oh, this person has 30,000 followers on Twitter, whatever. And you start to judge your, um, the value of your network by the numbers. And that's not really the best way to evaluate a network. You can buy 30,000 Twitter followers. It'll cost you a lot of money. You may not get any benefit back out of that because Honestly, a lot of them are going to be bots. A lot of them are whatever. Even if I even I get those thirty thousand organically, um, most of the time, um, if I'm accruing large numbers of followers very quickly, they're not that invested in me. They're not looking to continue a relationship with me, and they're certainly not looking to spend money on me. So I need to build a better relationship with my Twitter followers. Again, if I join groups, I get thirty thousand um, people because I signed up for that hot group of the week. But those people are pretty. They're pretty casual. They're not really attached to me. Does that make sense? So um, so you start looking at, okay, do I want 30,000 disinterested followers? And you know, a lot of times in the author cross-promotion groups, you'll get this, where everybody agrees to Twitter follow everybody else, and then you all agree to retweet each other's links, and nobody's actually reading anybody's links. <laughs> We're all just retweeting them, and it's resulting in a lot of spam and very little turnover. Um, or if I have 300 people who are super engaged and interested in what I'm doing and they're, they want to spend money on me and they want to share me with their friends who also have the same interests. And this is a much smaller number, but it's a much more efficient way to go about it. So um, be cautious, you know, don't get caught up in a numbers game. I don't think numbers, big numbers don't impress me. So one thing I ask a lot um, when, when I hear somebody talking about, you know, oh, well, I did such and such and it's, and it's you know gotten me. In, I've got four thousand more Twitter followers this week than I did last week because I joined such and such group or you know whatever the case may be. And occasionally I'll say, okay, what's the click through rate? You know, what's your return on that? How many of those people are converting into buyers? And usually nobody knows even knows how to answer that question. And I'm like, well, if you don't, if you're not tracking, you know, your click throughs, how do you know where to spend your time and energy? Um, and so now you're all excited because you have 4,000 people, but those 4,000 people are never going to do anything for you. So um, make sure that you've got smaller numbers are okay as long as they're engaged. And I just say that because I see so often uh, that, that people focus on getting big numbers rather than people getting engaged numbers. So we'll talk about that. If you're familiar with the idea behind the 1,000 through fans, um, this is the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, this is where they worked out the math that an artist can survive with only 1,000 true fans, and the artist can make a living on that. Um, and so we, won't, we don't need to go into the background. You can certainly Google that and, and read about that. But um, one of the things with that is you're not going to get 1,000 true fans by just trying to randomly pick people up. Uh, at this estimate is you're going to get one true fan for every 100 to 500 people. And that's going to take you an incredibly long time to play those odds. Um, instead, go through, pick up relevant fans, fans who are already interested. You're picking them up organically. You're picking them up because they're interested in your content. And you can acquire people who are more likely to buy right up front rather than by acquiring a lot of casual followers. So uh, let's try that. It's not about numbers. It's about engagement. That's the that's the big take home from this. So you guys are on MailChimp. Um, one of the nice things about MailChimp is they'll show you what an industry average is, uh, an open rate is for uh, any of your newsletters, and for writing and media and uh, publishing. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the number on your screen, 21.99%. Uh, so that's roughly one out of five. Uh, emails um, that go out in any particular given newsletter campaign will get opened. And my personal list is just just a hair over 50%. And you look at that and you're thinking, 50%, geez, you know? And the other hand, you're going, that's way more than one out of five. Um, so and what I can do, and I, I haven't done this, but I need to be better about it, is you can actually go in and see who opened those 
and who missed them when maybe they just were on vacation that week, who knows? And you can resend to those people who didn't get them. I, I, I don't do that much, but I need to be better about that. And you can get that open rate back up even higher. But the, again, the idea here is my email list is a lot smaller, a lot smaller than a lot of people's, but they're more engaged. Okay, if I have a huge, uh, a huge email list, but fewer people opening it, you can slide those numbers around a lot and actually get more conversions with a smaller list. So, so what's the point of all this number block talk? I mean, it's really, it's, nobody wants to talk about math. Um, not, not in a writer's group, we don't talk about numbers. Um, the best way to get those high conversions is to use your branding to only pick up people who are interested and likely to buy in the first place. Does that make sense? So I'm narrowing my targets. I don't want to appeal to everybody. I want to appeal to people who are going to buy. I want to appeal to people who are going to stay engaged. And your personality and your branding are the best way to get people to self-select, that's the key term, to, uh, to sign up to your list or whatever. So, okay, this is my personal pet peeve. So stand back, I'm on a soapbox. Social media so it should feel social. Like it's about connecting with people. That's why it's social. If it's just about spamming, we call those billboards and they clutter up the scenery on the interstates, okay? Uh, people are people, they're not a transaction. It's not about acquiring the biggest numbers of file followers, it's about having a conversation with other people. Uh, social media is the best place to build relationships. Even as, like, uh, and if you look at you know, Fortune 500 companies on Facebook and Twitter, they're not on Facebook and Twitter to make sales. It's a terrible place to make sales. Like their, their ROI on that is ridiculously tiny. It's like fractions of a single percent. What it is good at is maintaining relationships, making customers feel like they have an actual connection with the company. Well, I have a bonus. I really am a person. So it's easier for me to make a personal connection. Sales are a result of that. They're not a tactic on themselves on social media. So if you're familiar with the marketing rule of seven, uh, the simple version of that is people need at least seven touch points on average uh, before they're motivated to act or purchase. So if uh, somebody brings out a new brand of soup for whatever, you know, I maybe see that brand on the shelf, but it's not familiar to me. I'm not going to invest in it just yet, but there's a, there's a site. I know it's on the shelf. And then I see an ad for it in a magazine that I enjoy. And I maybe have good associations with that magazine. So um, there's, a, there's a second one. And then my friend tells me that she tried it and really liked it. Oh, man, that counts for big because, you know, word of mouth is, is great. And I trust my friend. She's not trying to sell me something. So that's really good. And you know, so I'm going through. And usually, on average, um, by the time you hit about seven exposures, that's when I'll say, you know what, I'll try this. Okay. Now, nobody's counting. Like, the customer isn't counting. Oh, I've seen it five times this week. Okay. This is a subconscious thing. But uh, my theory is marketing people have paid an obscene amount of money to study this over decades. I'm gonna just take their word for it, okay? So what this means is if, if I just get on Twitter and shout out, hey, buy my book, okay? One, that's a first contact. I'm not, it's kind of unrealistic to expect people to, to act after a single, uh, single exposure. And two, that wasn't a really personal first contact and I'm not building much of a relationship and they're just going to feel like I'm spamming them. And that's not what we want to do on social media. You frequently hear about the 80, 20 rule. Uh, that is when you put, you know, 80% content out and 20% sales. And I feel like that's way too spammy still. Um, and the way I think of that is if I had a friend who, Every four, t you know, four times um, I saw her and, and we had lunch or you know, whatever, and every fifth time I saw her, she asked me for money. You know, that, I, I don't know how that relationship would go. And I was talking about this with a friend and I said, yeah, so I'm just thinking like how to phrase this. And I'm like, how long would we be friends if that happened? And he looked at me, he said, four visits. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> um, so again, this is about building relationships. I don't want to come across as I'm asking you for money 20% of the time that I see you. Um, so I was listening to a, a talk uh, that audible.com actually was having about marketing and they were explaining that um, you have a, a brand and maybe you say you post a kitten picture and you post a kitten picture and you post a kitten picture, you post a kitten picture, you post a kitten picture and you keep doing this lots and lots and lots of kitten pictures. People are really getting used to checking in with you for your daily kitten picture and then one day you have a cat food sale, okay? But by this point, people already are thinking cat thoughts when they see you. 
they're going to you specifically to find fun cat related material and um and then finally we get to you know oh there's a sale and people at that point are ready to invest because they already trust you for kitten pictures okay so um i'm hoping this is making sense it's really odd doing webinars where i uh, most of my speaking is live and i can see if people are following or having questions so okay um give me one second i'm adjusting something with my my video over here so okay Sorry, I wanted to make sure I could I could still see your videos, your questions and things. So don't oversell. Um, I, I had someone ask me recently, are you friends with so-and-so? And I'm about to mute him from my feed. And it was because he was posting a lot of sales uh, on his personal feed. This was during a launch. I understand that you know, just the person telling me this works in PR. Okay, this is a person who positively understands the need for launch promotion and yet was seriously turned off by the, the overselling that was happening. Don't turn off your audience. Nobody wants to feel like you're only valuable as a sales, sales number, okay? Um, that's, if you think about how you interact with, uh, with things that you want to buy, um, you know, I'll follow, I'll follow a big company if I'm interested in coupons, I'll follow a big company, um, if I'm interested in product information, uh, I don't follow a company so they can yell at me with a new ad every morning. Okay, that's that's not the reason. I already know they have stuff for sale. That's not why I'm gonna interact with them. So, so my, my last 25 Facebook posts, and obviously this isn't my last one, this is the last time, five, 25 at the time I put together uh, this slide earlier this month. I have, I have a lot of things on the left that are, um, I won't say irrelevant, they're actually quite relevant but they're not related to anything about sales. So I have some work in progress information. I've got um, some funny role-playing game jokes. Um, I've got quotes. I've got links to other authors' events that I think would be interested to my readers um, because of what they have. Um, I've got some funny videos. I've got personal remarks about my own writing process. I've got lots of things going on. On the right-hand column, I have a blog post with a link about uh, costumes and fan art at fan conventions. That one had a buy link associated with it for a book. I had an announcement that the book was available and a buy link. I ran two giveaways and I did ask once um, for people to sign up to my newsletter. That's free, but I did still ask them to act on my behalf. And I had a link to the mini con this, for this Saturday. So I was advertising a little bit of that, that as well. But if you look at the disparity between these, um, we're actually getting kind of close to that 20% um thing but this was during a launch okay this is the spammiest i get was um this few days around around launch period and i think i have people who come to my facebook page and like my posts every single day these aren't people i even know in real life okay but they know that my page is a good source of entertainment and information and that's what's keeping them coming so then when i do have a link i do have something for them to get one, it's not a spam link that they've seen 20 times before. It's something new. And because they already have found my page to be useful, they're more likely to trust that link when it comes along. Okay. So here's the key then. It goes back to the thousand fans. Don't try to please everybody. You're never going to be able to please everybody. And you don't want to please everybody. Again, it goes back to the subgenres. If I have someone who loves cozy mysteries and they pick up a procedural, they're not going to be happy and they're going to leave a nasty review. And it's not because, you know, it's a bad book. It's because it wasn't what they wanted. So you want to find readers who are wanting to read exactly what you're writing. Okay. So as far as my personal Facebook post goes, if you don't like my role-playing game and geek jokes, and if you don't like my folklore and you don't like my feminism, you're not going to like my books. Okay. So I, I'm filtering my readers right from the beginning um, so that I don't get somebody who picks up uh, picks up my, <laughs> picks up a mystery or, or whatever, and they pick up one of their books and they're like, wait a minute, the girl punches the guy at the end, not the guy punches the guy. How could that be? I'm offended. And you know, so I don't, I never even get that review. Okay. Self-filtering. Why advertise to the wrong market? Use your social media to filter out your potential readership to get just the readership that you want. 
Your online persona should match the tone of your books. Um, if you're snarky, hip in real life and you write sweet Amish romance, this may surprise your, your people who find you on Twitter and develop conversations with you and then pick up one of your books and it feels totally different. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be your characters. Most of us are not our characters. Some of us, it's a really, really good thing that we are not our characters. Uh, but overall tone, overall feel, overall themes should probably match. And again, you are your brand. You are your marketing. Uh, if you wouldn't do it in real life, don't do it online. If you do do it in real life, go, go ahead and do it online. And just remember that you're not... You're not trying to please everyone. So I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to make nerd jokes. It's going to happen. You can't stop me. I hope you like nerd jokes. <laughs> All right. And yes, uh, Google is a thing. We have Google alerts. If you bash my book, I know about it. Okay. I'm not going to come back at you, but I'm probably not going to be, you know, right away, uh, you know, post for your next book when it comes out or, you know, whatever the case may be. And this, this isn't even between authors and authors. This is anybody and anybody. Um, so, you know, we have a, we have a social community and we want to keep it social. Uh, mailing lists. Um, I think everybody knows how critical mailing lists are. Um, they're one of the few ways we have to directly contact our readers and, uh, and promote directly to them when they've asked us to tell us, you know, please send me your sales link. Um, tell me when you have a new book coming out. Um, they're also one of the few ways to contact readers where, uh, we can reach them readily without depending on the vagaries of timing on Twitter or algorithms and Facebook. The big mistake I see people making a mailing list is uh, they're not being compliant with the Can Spam Act. And they do this because they're just collecting addresses or adding people to their list without getting opt-ins. Um, you must have a physical mailing address on your newsletter. It is legal to use a P.O. box. You don't have to put your actual street address if you're not comfortable doing that, but you do need a physical address to be legal. You need an unsubscribe link in every single thing that goes out from you. And the easiest way, you can do all of this manually, but it's honestly, it's far easier if you just use a mailing service. My personal favorite is MailChimp. There are lots of uh, other ones out there. Um, some of them are more advantageous depending on which size group, which size mailing list you have. So it's worth checking them out. Um, but it's definitely not worth it um, to try to save, first of all, I don't think you actually save time and money by trying to do everything yourself instead of by using a service. Um, usually you're spending a lot more time, time is money, um, trying to do everything yourself. And you know, if it does come up as a, you know, it's a felony. You know, that's, and, the, and the fine is expensive per person. Don't go there. So the other thing that uh, a mailing service will do for you is they'll give you the uh, analysis so I, I don't know if I just send something out from my personal Gmail account, how many people opened that and what time of day and what they, whether or not they clicked through the link and all that sort of thing. Uh, MailChimp will give me all of that information. It's just built into my account. It's great. Sorry, I was grabbing a drink. Okay, so um, we're like, okay, well, if I can't spam everybody with sales, uh, sales links all of the time, um, then what can I post? And actually, I'm going to interrupt myself for a second because I just saw a question pop up about, uh, about MailChimp. Um, I noticed MailChimp or Google is making a big deal if an email comes from a domain name or a free email address. Would you say getting a domain name is imperative? Um, I, I touched on this super briefly earlier, but I mean, it's definitely worth underlining. I think a domain name is imperative, not just for email, but for other things as well. Um, when I put up the two websites side by side, one looking fairly reputable and one looking fairly scary, um, one of the differences between those in my arbitrary uh, tried thing is one of them is uh, a website.com and one of them is a blogspot.com, you know, name.blogspot.com. Nothing break against blogspot personally, it's just one of the many free, free website uh, options out there. But there, there's a definite uh, professionalism difference if you look at something um, it, 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 I always tell people, th take it out of you and look at it in another industry. So if, uh, if I need an electrician, uh, if I need a doctor, if I need somebody who, who needs to be good and, and they have their own website versus they have a Facebook page and nothing else or something, you know, I, I it just, there's definitely a, a difference in presentation. 
Um, and then, yes, it is true. Um, I can't speak with any authority on how much difference it makes, but there is does seem to be some difference in um, uh, web uh, in email processing uh, based on whether you're sending it from uh, a, what I'll call a, a legitimate domain name, but a purchased domain name, you know, lauravanarndonkba.com versus lara at gmail.com. Okay, so um, I hope that answered the question. Um, Anyway, so if I'm not just posting, you know, by links all the time, um, what can I post? Well, if you're Neil Gammon, who I think we can all agree has nailed this making money at writing thing. Uh, he's posting pictures of chipmunks, okay? Jim Butcher, whose last uh, last hardback release, I think sold 96,000 copies in hardback before going to paperback, ebook, and uh, audiobook sales. Um, and he's posting cosplay pictures. Um, so these these are um, this actually I was pretty excited I went to his page to grab something for this uh, for this uh, webinar and I'm like oh this is my friend Amanda so I was able to to write back in that because I didn't know who the cosplayers were and I was able to write in and identify them for them and started a conversation with them hey now I've made everybody involved happy because I'm able to share information that's only going to come back and you now I mean there are other reasons to do too but you can always build relationships that way. So, um, and you're thinking, okay, that's great, but what do I post to help marketing? First of all, let me back up and say, these things are helping marketing, okay? If every time you looked at Neil Gaiman or Jim Butcher and you saw a buy link, you would get really annoyed for the reasons we talked about before. What I'm learning is, oh, Jim Butcher likes Stranger Things and cosplay. Oh, I like these kinds of things, okay? Um, Neil Gaiman, oh, that's a really cute chipmunk picture. I wonder what else he's, pictures he's posting tomorrow, okay? You know, so you start building just some interest, and they look like real people. They have actual interests, okay? Um, but if I want to do something that's very marketing specific, and these, again, these are examples from me. They're not intended to be copy-pasted. We're going for concepts behind them, okay? Um, so one of the things I'm doing, the, uh, Bethany Jennings is an author who every once in a while organizes a WIP Joy Month, um, so work in progress, joy, and every day of the month, um, she has a question that you answer about your work in progress. Um, so this is something that allows me to talk about my work in progress without sounding pushy, because I'm just participating in kind of a little thing about it. My readers who are coming to my page are getting little teasers, and all of this counts for that marketing rule of seven. So if I can make all my little teasers interesting, even if they're not following, even if they're not catching all 30 of them in any given month, they're getting little bits of and fun. So the one on the left, you know, that's a little bit of a tease. Like I'm answering the question of having a good time, but I'm hoping if you're in my readership, if, if you're not in my genre, you're like, dear God, I'm so glad I'm not having to look at that. That's fine. <laughs> okay. And then I don't, if you're not in my genre, I don't want you hanging around on my page because I'm not going to convert you anyway. All right. I keep my conversion rates really high. Um, and then on the right, um, this one is I'm getting in a little bit more of a, of a sales sales thing here. Um, I released a, a book um, this week. It has mermaids in it. And so here's a, here's a joke. It's funny because Google Translate screwed up the uh, sirens. Uh, the word, word in Spanish uh, is sirenas, sirenas, and that's um, for both mermaids and you know, emergency sirens. So there's, there's a translator error. It's funny. Ha, 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 ha. By the way, mermaids can be dangerous. We'll talk about it next week. Okay. So um, I'm just putting little teases out there. On my blog, I'll have um, different bits of, I like to blog about research, um, mostly because I'm a nerd. So I find it interesting. And I like to pretend that everybody else finds it interesting. <laughs> so, but the thing is, I'm actually filtering out the people who do and don't find that interesting. So I'm talking about underwater earthquakes. I'm talking about um, elephants. I'm talking about all the things I'm learning about infrasound. I'm talking about this kind of stuff. And talking about that I'm relating it to a work in progress. And so, yeah, these, again, count as rule of seven exposures. If you look at this and go, I have no interest in this whatsoever, fantastic. You're not in the market for this book. But if you find it interesting, now you know that I'm working on it and you're coming back and finding out little bits of it more. And then ultimately, oh, did you find all that stuff interesting? You might like the book. <laughs> By the way, it's for sale now. And I can actually do a softer sell rather than have to be, hey, buy this book, buy this book, you know, kind of thing. It's all about the rule of seven. And I've, hopefully by the time I've done this, I have have people who have self-filtered. It's a, it's a funnel. Not everybody's going to be interested in it. I want to funnel out the people who are. So this is one um, example I pulled out that I think is a sweet spot 
that's um, hopefully that uh, is a concept that will be uh, helpful. So I've got a, a screen cap here of a post I did about um, a person who allegedly took a photo of the Loch Ness Monster. And so I talk a little bit about, oh, it's a fun picture. Um, this, this is a more plausible explanation, um, that kind of thing. By the way, there's a story about cryptozoologists that will be coming out in February. Cryptozoologists are people who hunt for Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, uh, Chupacabra, that kind of thing. So this, what makes this the sweet spot is it's fun. Yay, photo of Nessie, hooray. It's shareable. Oh, did you see the photo of Nessie? Okay, so it's definitely a conversation piece. There's a subtle mention of my upcoming story, but it's not a really hard sell. This is a rule of seven exposure with a five month lead. So I've got a number of more times to get, you know, those other six exposures in there and I can afford to do it in a soft, soft way. And then here's another one. Um, this was a very deliberate, I didn't, I didn't, I did this for fun when I was writing it, but then it turned into a very deliberate marketing thing for me. So, um, I have Tom the Baker as a side character wandering through a scene. He's, he's shown up several times as the baker in town. But here in the scene, he starts to ask, would you like a jelly? And then he gets cut off. If you are in the Doctor Who geek community, the fourth doctor is played by Tom Baker and his signature line is, would you like a jelly baby? Okay, so this is just totally a little geek throwaway. Most people will read right over it. Even Doctor Who fans will read right over it, but a few people will catch it and call it out. Um, so again, I have a very geeky, nerdy readership, and so I can call out you when know, you get this. And then now they're feeling very clever because they have insider knowledge. They're getting, they know the in joke in this particular page, and uh, so. What I've done here is I deliberately screen capped that, pointed out the re the geek reference, and then asked them to go grab a free book for my for my email address, um, for my my email list. So I'm still asking them for something. I am asking them to give me their address, but I've paid for it with a joke and a free story, both. Not just you know, there's lots of sign up for my mailing list and get a free story. This time I you know, gave them a joke and I let them feel smart because they know something somebody else doesn't. Okay. So that's, I'm viewing that as kind of a sweet spot. And, um, and I got about 30, uh, 30 subscribers. I don't know how many I can contribute, uh, can attribute directly to this particular post and joke. Uh, but I have about 30 new subscribers this week. So we'll see, uh, if that continues to go. So, all right. And then this is the prep session for, uh, for Saturday. We talk about um, our photography, um, and um, this is usually I run this uh, in person. We all get up and practice posing. So I'm just going to trust that you're practicing at home, or at least that you're taking notes to practice when we get off the webinar. So um, we'll do this. All right. So Tosca Lee, if you're not familiar with her, she's a New York Times bestselling author. She's very good. Um, she is her, the last book I made myself stop so I wouldn't finish it and one sitting on the plane because I needed to sleep because I was changing continents and I needed to go to sleep. And the only reason I put it down was because I knew I would not be functional if I didn't go to sleep. It was a really good book. She's also a former pageant queen and a model. She nails photography and professional appearance and the rest of us are not that talented. So we're gonna talk about options for people who aren't former pageant queens. But if you ever need inspiration, go look at Tosca. So, they always say, you know, dress for the job you want. When you interview, dress, don't dress for the job you have, dress for the job you want. I say photograph for the sales rank you want. So um, if, if you look at, you know, any of these names over here who are making way more money than I am in book sales, not one of them took a cell phone selfie in front of their, you know, bush, <laughs> their dead bush <laughs> or, or something, you know. They went out and they have really nice um, shots that, that suggest they're a professional and that's the thing is we want to appear to be professional. Um, so if they aren't doing, you know, low grade photos and poses, then why are we doing it? So don't get me wrong, candids and casual pictures are awesome for social media. Um, there's a lot that we'll talk about with that, but you need to use different photos for different purposes. Have an entire directory of author photos that you can pull out for any particular occasion. So book jacket, um, Rowling nails it. Come on, she's, she's, the amount of money she has, she can pay, pay a stylist before she's going to nail it. 
Um, but there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, it, you know, it would look totally different if she had the same pose and the same lighting as wearing a t-shirt with some printing on it, branding, you know, advertising, or whatever. So she's put together uh, a complete, um, a complete look. She just looks very professional. Um, but you still want some personal flavor with that. You know, you don't want to hear, this shouldn't be interchangeable that all of these people look alike. Okay. So that's like my book jacket. This is my, my signing, my signing poster or something where I need to present as professionally as possible. That's not going to be the only way I present myself as an author though. On social media, I'm going to have a good time. Okay. So this is Jim Butcher. I mentioned earlier um, his last book, the hardcover sales alone were almost 100,000, and that doesn't count the other three formats that it dropped in. Um, so clearly his goofy photos aren't hurting him at all. I say they're actually helping him because his readership is also fairly geeky. Um, his readership is, is having a good time. They're, they like seeing him play with a sword, and they like seeing him with his punny geeky t-shirt, and they like seeing him that he has a cute dog. Hooray, he's a real person, okay? So... You do want to, as I said, you still want to look like you dressed yourself, but you, you can have some personality because social media is social. Social media is not for selling. Social media is for developing relationships that then often lead to sales, but not, you know, that's not, that's not where we start. Okay. So one easy way to think of this is just like your book cover, your headshot should be a movie poster. Um, so even if you haven't seen these films, you can look at this and then know immediately from color palette and you know, body posture and facial expression and all of that, you know immediately what genre of films these are. Um, you don't have to uh, have seen them or have read the books they're based on. You can get it from the palette. You get it from the poses. Okay, there's a, there's a whole attitude and mood that goes with it. So think of your uh, photos in the same way. So I have two photo, uh, author photos here, and I will use these for different genres or different events, um, just because they have a slightly different feel. And, um, and neither is better than the other, they're better for different things. So the one on the left might be better for urban fantasy. Um, so maybe I'll use it if I'm talking about an urban fantasy or if I'm doing a presentation and uh, something related to that. So you can um, Mix and match a little bit. I don't think you want to be recognizable um, across the board, but I don't think you have to just stick to one photo for all, all purposes. Um, okay, as we talk about this, I'm going to use a lot of photos of me because I have photos about me, and some of the things I'm going to be talking about are things that I'm doing wrong, and I will pick on me before I will pick on another person. So uh, I know I can't hear you, but you are absolutely welcome to giggle at the pit, bits that I'm doing wrong but that's why you're going to see a lot of photos of me. So, um, so this is the same person and two dramatically different photos. Um, and it has nothing to do with, uh, <laughs> it has nothing to do with the subject. It has everything to do with how the photo was taken. So the photo on the left, and we did specifically set it up, um, you know, so I could get a, a, a before picture, I guess, for this panel, for this um, presentation. But we didn't, we didn't really do that much um, to, to, make it, um, to make it terrible. We just set it up in a very average, candid scenario, and we knew that it, how it would come out. Um, so my sister and I took this photo. Um, she's, a, she's a photographer, and, uh, and I, she and I have both done a truckload of photo shoots. So that's why um, we were able to go, oh, let's just, let's just put the light here, and we'll do this. So it's taken with a flash. Uh, it's taken with a direct on-camera flash as opposed to an off-camera flash. Um, that flash has created a shadow behind me on the wall, which gives me that kind of weird black halo effect. Um, because I'm facing straight on into the camera and smiling, I've got several chins happening going on, <laughs> going on right there. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that I, mean, I think I don't have to explain it to you. If you look at these two photos, one of these one of these is much more flattering than the other, aside from being a more professional looking shot. Okay. It also, one of them also looks like, I, oh, I, I, maybe I have a better job than the other or something. Um, or maybe I'm better at what I'm doing. Um, but there's a huge difference and it's nothing to do with, uh, it's the, the one on the right also was not in a studio. It did not have, you know, a ridiculous lighting setup or something like that. It has to do with posing. It has to do with um, how we're taking the photo. So, 
this is the part where somebody stops to argue that I don't take, you know, I don't take good pictures. There are people who just don't take good pictures. This is the part where I'm going to argue with you. Most people with terrible photos set themselves up for terrible photos. I refer you to the photo on the left, okay? There is no way to salvage that photo. If you put, fill in your favorite supermodel here, it's going to be a terrible photo, okay? Most people with terrible photos set themselves up to take terrible photos. If you flatten a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional image, it's going to be unflattering because <laughs> we're flattening is an inherently unnatural process, okay? And for most people, it's an inherently unflattering process. We have to work to make going through three dimensions to two into something that's not awful. Photography is a skill on both sides of the camera. So your job is to find a photographer who's good, but even the best photographer can't work with somebody who won't pose well for them. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. The good news is skills can be learned. Hooray! <laughs> so we're going to learn how to take better photos, and it doesn't have to involve Photoshop. Okay, Photoshop won't hurt you, but Photoshop can't. I, I, go, I go back to this photo on the left. All the Photoshop in the world is not going to salvage that picture. Okay, you have to set, take the good photo to start with. So yes, yes, you can. I can't hear you, but just please humor me. Nod, say I can take a good photo. Okay. All right, but I can't do that. This is the, usually the protest that follows immediately afterwards. Um, there's a number of things that come up here. Makeup is unnatural. Okay, yeah, makeup's unnatural. I'm taking crushed dirt and smearing it on my face. It's a long history of unnatural, but it is unnatural. Threat, the flattening a three-dimensional person into a two-dimensional image is unnatural. Okay, there's a lot of what we're doing that is unnatural. So why draw the arbitrary, this is natural when this and unnatural, but it's okay, but this is unnatural, it's not okay, why draw that line where it does you the fewest favors? So um, that's, my, that's my commentary on makeup. Typing on an alphabetically disordered keyboard to send immaterial pictures of cats across the planet to people you don't know is unnatural, but you do it for marketing. You can do this for marketing too. I don't care if you wear makeup in your daily life. I don't care, you know, if you like makeup. None of this matters. What matters is we're talking about taking a photo one small segment of time. Makeup and posing are vanity. Okay. Complaining about bad photos is vanity, right? Not using a photo because you don't like it is vanity. Avoiding cameras in case it takes a bad photo is vanity. So again, we're drawing the line where it does the fewest favors. Um, and I will point out, if you're, you're the person who stops a group photo um, or won't let people take a candid photo or whatever because you don't want to risk a bad picture, you're putting your vanity ahead of everybody else's good time and memories. And um, I just spent, uh, a tr I did a trip with a bunch of women and we had people trying to take photos and people who kept, you know, interrupting photos or hiding behind other people or leaving photos or leaving scenes in case there was a photo. And it was incredibly disruptive and it would have been better if we'd all just chilled out, you know? Okay. So, next protest, but I'm a man. <laughs> I can't, I can't do this. I hear this a lot too. First off, hey, it's 2016, guy liner's a thing. Like, that's okay. But I'm not even asking you to do that. I'm asking you just to do something that'll benefit you a little bit for the camera, like thousands of other males do in this country every single day. Um, and my theory is you can't argue with Chuck Norris. If Chuck Norris will take off the shine, you know, to, to get a good photo, you can do it and you still keep your man card. It's okay. So I have no idea who this newscaster is. Don't judge this photo based on the newscaster. I just pulled a, uh, pulled a screenshot. But my point is every one of these people is wearing makeup every time you see them because it's their job to appear professional and relatable. It's your job to appear professional and relatable. So even if you just do it for your photo, that's all I'm asking you to do. But I can't do that. I will feel stupid posing. Um, you're not going to look stupid. And if you feel stupid, then that's that's you. That's not you or the that's not the pose. Okay. I can't tell you how you'll feel, but if you feel awkward or if you feel guilty about trying to make yourself look better, we're probably dealing something deeper than a headshot. It is totally fine to like your photos. It is totally fine to present yourself well. It is not egotistical to like your photos, and it's not uh, vanity to present yourself well, especially if you're doing it for your career, okay? So 
All right. So then let's talk about why am I even talking about this stuff. My background, um, I'm a cosplayer, I'm a costumer, you can call it a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things I do is I create ridiculous outfits and I get photos in them. I also wear them around and do a lot of presentations and performances and a lot of things, but there are a lot of photo shoots that are done to document this. So my background is used, is I spend a lot of time taking photos to depict a character, to depict a mood, and to get the most flattering photo possible of that particular costume and secondarily me in it, okay? Um, we're, this is beyond most, most author headshots, um, but hopefully you can see, um, I've just grabbed several photos here, but you can see the one on the left has a lot more mood going on than the one in the middle, but, um, but all of them, have, you get a little tiny bit of sense of who these people are and how they relate to each other and, and such, um, and that's what I'm hoping to, uh, to get you guys doing uh, here so you can get some mood in your author headshots. So this is almost always one of the first questions I get. How do I look skinnier in the photo? Um, so the bad news is we're flattening a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional image. Anytime we flatten something, it gets wider. That's just physics. Um, so we're going to, um, we're going to, you're, sorry. Um, there are some tricks to work with that, and we're going to talk about them. Um, by the way, people who are writing in saying, no, really, I don't take good pictures, um, work with me here, okay? And I'm happy, by the way, I'm totally happy on Saturday. Catch me if you want to do some practice before your photography session. Um, I'm totally, totally thrilled to, to work with you and get you set up for that. Um, this is information that you can go practice in a mirror beforehand, um, but I'm, I'm game with it. It's cool. Catch me on Saturday. Okay. How to lose 10 pounds. First one, get over it. <laughs> I'm not 17 anymore. I, I make the joke. It's totally true. Um, when I became, you know, before I was published and before I was like putting a lot of time and effort and, you know, into my career and what I would, what I would call successful, I, I was one weight. And now that I am a successful published author, I'm 30 pounds heavier because I sit on my butt and edit all day instead of like doing something exciting. Um, and yes, I can, I can address that and deal with it, but I also can't say, you know, oh no, I'm 10 pounds heavier. I can't be in this photo, um, because that's not going to be an option. Um, the second part of that is make changes if necessary. That 30 pounds that on me personally, I would like to lose them, but I'd like to lose them for health reasons. You know, it's not just the weight. I would also like to have a better cardiovascular system and things that I used to have that I don't have now. Um, and so if you're worried about your body, get healthier, okay? If you're only worried about the aesthetics of a photo, learn to cheat in photos. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how to cheat in photos. Um, so, and again, I'm happy to work with you in person on this on Saturday. Play with it at home first, and, we'll, and then we'll cheat like Matt on Saturday. So use posture, use positioning to enhance what you have. Um, and when I say the figure you have, Figure gets interpreted a lot of different ways. You can leave off all the cultural baggage with the word, okay? You, you, whatever figure you want to mean, you go ahead and you know make it mean that. Um, and lighting will also have a big uh, a big difference with this. Um, it's not lying; it's storytelling. That's my uh, <laughs> that's my help for you. So if you're feeling guilty about uh, looking better in your photos. Oh, this is a great comment that just came in from Victoria. Most of our readership falls in the overweight category of Americans anyway. They won't judge their favorite overweight author. That's a fantastic point. Um, yeah, we live in a uh, we live in a society which is uh, um, kind of chronically overweight. So it is. If somebody looks at your if somebody looks at your back get back cover and says, "Wow, that person's heavier than they should be," I'm not going to buy their book. Realistically, they weren't going to buy your book in the first place, and if they did, they were going to leave you a nasty review. So just hooray, rejoice that you avoided that negativity to start with. Okay, so we're going to story tell in our photos. So this is where I start making fun of um, my photos a little bit. Um, but if you look at these two pictures, there's, I will notice this first because it's my picture, okay? So let me, let me point this out in the beginning. You are all much, much more harsh with your own photos than with anyone else's. So um, when you look at your photo and you start thinking it looks terrible, um, 
And then you look at somebody else's photo and you're like, but that's not so bad. That's exactly how everybody perceives it. You're always going to be harshest with your own photos. So, but I look at this and I notice that my hips in the photo on the left are a lot wider than my hips in the photo on the right. And that has to do with how I'm positioned. I didn't, as you can see, the two photos were taken seconds apart. I didn't have a significant weight change. Okay. But the photo on the left, I'm leaning against something which uh, has that lovely squish your butt effect to kind of pump, plump, plump everything. And um, the way the rest of my body is positioned, my torso's kind of slouchy, so it's short, so everything gets wider by comparison. Um, and just my whole positioning is not doing me a whole lot of favors. The photo on the right, I'm taking a little bit of a step forward. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, my hand has dropped down to just create a little bit of an edge and shadow over my hips. So it looks like it cuts, it cuts off. It looks a little bit thinner there. And I'm not slouching as much. The rest of my body looks longer, therefore leaner, because that's how, that's how uh, optics work. So, um, so it's, a, it's just a position change. And I look like I have a 10 pound difference in those two photos. Um, and again, if you looked at those, you're like, well, I didn't think either one looked bad. That's how other people look at your photos. Okay, so keep that in mind. Give yourself that as a little pep talk. But we are going to set up um, ways you can cheat. So eye contact is fine too. Most of the photos I'm showing here, I realized when I was putting them together, didn't have a lot of eye contact. Um, and that just, just happens because those are the photos I'm pulling out to use for examples. It's absolutely fine to look at the camera. Uh, don't think that you have to be uh, distant and, and cool and looking into the future. Unless that's your genre and that's your branding, in which case, absolutely do that. So for everybody involved, male and female, there's a move that I call the turtle, uh, which uh, I learned from a photographer, um, oh gosh, at least a decade ago. Um, probably, no, longer than that at this point. Um, you're going to uh, lift your head and slouching makes this very difficult. So um, practice this in a mirror and if you, if you can click on your webcam right now and practice it while we're talking, that would be fantastic. If not, just take some notes and you're going to do this in the mirror. And you're going to push your face forward very slightly. And this pulls out the double chin. It adds a little bit more shadow. So it um, makes, your, makes your chin look leaner. It makes your neck look longer. You don't want to look like a giraffe. Do practice this in advance because almost, I can guarantee you, the first time you do it, you're going to overdo it a lot. When I do it, it feels like I'm moving about an eighth of an inch. I'm probably moving a little bit further than that. But they, what I want you to remember here is it's a tiny movement. It should not feel like a huge movement. So if you look at these two pictures, I took these two photos this afternoon to drop into this um, uh, thing. And at first glance, these two photos are darn similar okay these are completely 100 percent unretouched i took these under a kitchen light in front of my wall and they're um yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're just straight up there's no photoshop magic in these if you look at the photo on the left look at my chin and then compare it to my chin on the right you start seeing a little bit of a difference there if there were if i had taken these in good lighting the difference would be more dramatic um or I could I could have touched the uh, I could have done this in Photoshop to make it look more dramatic. But I wanted to tell you that these were totally untouched photos. Um, so the what that did that by moving my chin forward that what feels like an eighth of an inch. I mean it's a tiny amount. Um, I created more definition around the chin, which uh, again helped. Remember that double chin I had in the left hand photo, uh, the, the bad photo earlier. Um, by giving myself a little bit more shadow, a little bit more definition, I gave myself a little bit of sharper chin. I will tell you, I do not have a sharp chin. <laughs> I have a, um, a very soft chin. I am cheating like mad here. Okay. Actually, I strongly suspect that out of habit, I'm using, doing a little bit of that on the left because I always try to do that for photos because I don't like the way my chin looks. Um, but by, by, by chin, I mean the, the soft structure underneath, not the bony protrusion, which is just fine. Um, so if I'm, I'm, it's just a built-in cheat for me at this point. Here's the other thing about uh, making yourself look leaner in a photo. What are your arms doing? And this is one I see all the time uh, when people are worried about um, how their weight might present in a, in a photo. So if I'm facing the camera straight on, my arms at my side, 
okay, there's, I mean, my elbows are giving me a little bit of a curve there, but there's a not, um, it's not a lot of body definition there. And here's my lovely Photoshop job. I didn't try to make it look good. I wanted you to know it was bad Photoshop. But if I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt that's the same color as my torso, I've just made myself into a box. Now I look even chunkier, okay? This kind of, this, and this is how most people will pose if you ask them, hey, everybody, let's get a group shot, okay? And we get together and we do this. There's a really easy way to make yourself look a lot thinner right off the bat. And men, this works for you too. But again, we'll talk about differences for men and women here in a second. Um, and that is just to rotate and move your arms. But if I pull my arms away from my body, oh my gosh, what a huge difference that is. I didn't lose any weight, okay? And to tell you the truth, this is my, this is my heavier self here. I am cheating. Cheating, it's all about angles. And um, so that's... It's all about presentation. Okay, so ladies, this is the Mae West move. Um, Mae West, I hope you know who she is. If you don't, um, she was huge in the 20s and 30s as a massive, uh, massive sex, sex pot star. Um, and she continued making appearances and, and things up into, I think up into, up into her 60s. Um, and she continued to be a sex object uh, for a very long time, a sex icon. So. But here's what, what she did um, that I'm shamelessly stealing from. She put her thumb where she wanted her curve to be. And then she would pose the rest of her body um, accordingly. And um, as, a, as she got older and her figure was a little less um, marketable, say, she had her seams sewn in uh, the, where the figure should be, uh, where she wanted her figure to be and still use that as a guideline. And it, and it worked, it worked really well. So, uh, if you play with this, one foot is going to be pointing straight forward. So those toes are at 12 o'clock. The other foot, your toes will be at either four or eight o'clock, depending if it's the right or left foot. You'll put your hand on your waist or on your hip and experiment in a mirror to find out where the best placement is for you. I have a very high waist, so my pla hand placement in where and where I put my arms and such, it'll be very different than somebody who has a lower waist, like my sister. We're siblings, but we still need to pose differently if we're both trying to go for the super lean figure, okay? So you will need to practice this. The key here is that you're going to give yourself a profile rather than a flat front shot. So if you look at this photo, you're seeing her entire front, it looks like. But if you look at it, she's actually on a slight angle to you. And what she's doing is exactly what I did here on the, on the right-hand photo, where I dropped one foot back. That automatically minimizes my hips and pelvis. It also adds puts curve on both sides of my waist, where there wouldn't be curve if we had just had the, the flat profile on the, I'm sorry, the flat, flat front on the uh, left-hand picture. So, um, so then I can put my arms out and give myself a little bit of a curve and hooray, okay, I've, got, I've got a figure. Um, men and women both, find your face. Nobody's face is symmetrical. There is no such thing as a perfectly symmetrical face. So if you're picky about your appearance, you probably have one side of your face that you like better than the other. Um, usually there is uh, one, one side of your face will have a thinner thinner profile than the other. So if you're trying to minimize weight, you can use that one. Maybe you have a better cheekbone on one side. Maybe I have, a, I have scarring on my face, which doesn't bother me. But if I'm, you know, if I were going for a beauty shot, I'd probably go for the side of my face that didn't get torn open in an emergency surgery. Okay. So, and you can do, and you can do um, a lot with that. Then you're going to find the three quarter angle that highlights that side of your face. So if I have one, let's say the left side of my face is thinner, I'm going to do a three quarter shot. I'm just going to tip my chin slightly to the side so that the right side of my face is facing the camera. The left side of my face is the thinner side is the one that's in profile. So that will make my whole face look thinner. I'm hoping this makes sense if, uh, with, since I can't actually uh, see you guys trying it, but um, you can play with this in your mirror. And then as my little subtitle there says, match to genre. Um, because not every genre is going to be, not every look is going to be appropriate for every genre. Okay. Um, women, there's a number of ways we'll talk about uh, proposing for men and for women. In Western culture, we like to see curves on our women. Um, so we want to pose in ways that highlight 
uh, the curves at the waist, the curves at the hips. Um, so, as I mentioned, the one foot forward, she's stepping forward with her pelvis flat to the camera. If you want to slender, slenderize that pelvis, that's when you're going to let one side tip back a little bit like we just talked about. You're going to press your chin out. Um, I frequently see people recommending to pull the chin down um, for photos. I don't think that does anybody any favors. Um, supermodels can get away with that because many of them are already anorexic. For the most of us, um, that's not going to help us. I would say pr uh, practice, the, practice the turtle movement. Um, popping a hip to one side. There are absolutely ways to do that without looking like Betty Boop or some sort of, you know, sex poster or something. You can, <laughs> there are lots of ways to shape your weight. Again, this requires going in front of a mirror and experimenting. If you feel self-conscious about it, close the door, put on some music and give yourself permission to giggle. It's fine. Okay. Um, if you bring in your feet into a narrower stance, that usually gives you a little bit more curve in throughout your waist and hips. Um, you can bring in your toes or bend your knees in and use your hands um, to accentuate the hip or the waist. That's exactly what I was showing in those photos a moment ago. Men, we like straight lines on our men here in the Western Hemisphere. So you're going to put your feet a little bit apart so that you don't you don't have uh, don't have that hip curve that would we would oops, sorry that we would create there. You know, by bringing the feet in, we create um, more of an hourglass. Here we have a straight line running vertically. Um, chin up or out uh, to create um, an air of, air of confidence. Um, you can bring your, leave your arms down. A lot of times, pick, hooking your hands on your on your waistband or belt is a good place to put your hands for men. You can cross your arms to um, give yourself some authority. Bring your toes pointed out a little bit. And again, I always go back. <laughs> you will never see Chuck Norris with his toes pointed in. Okay, it's not going to happen. So. And then here's the critical part. This is much more important than your weight or your posture or anything else. What does your brand promise when you look at your photo? What's the mood? What's the tone? What's the genre? If your photo is a movie poster, what are we going? To, what movie are we going to see? And I think this is the critical thing when you're looking at your pictures. Now, your your picture doesn't have to sell your book in the same way that your book cover has to sell your book. But on the other hand, if if I, um, if you look at the photo on the right and this person selling, you know, sweet Amish romance, you're not going to feel that that's connected. Okay. Um, and I've got nothing against sweet Amish romance. It's just not what the person on the right here happens to write. So it's not going to match that author photo at all. Okay. Think about where your arms are. Um, if again, my arms are down on the left one, I have very little personality in that picture. There's very little, like, I'm smiling, yay, okay. Um, whereas on the right, there's a lot of stuff going on. This obviously is one of my costume photos. Um, I don't actually go to church dressed like this, but, well, sometimes I do, but <laughs> only for reasons. But uh, anyway, where I'm going with this is um, putting the arms in a more deliberate location conveys a lot about the character, conveys a lot about the mood, and it doesn't look like somebody just caught me in the hallway with a candid, okay? Um, okay, so I got a question about what if I don't want to do the traditional show the curves? That is a great question, and it's um, completely legit. And it goes back to again, what is your, um, what is your brand? What is your um, genre? And what are you trying to uh, present with this? Um, and what I would say there is, what mood do you want to carry? What do you want your photo to carry? Um, so if, do I want something that is, um, do I, do I want to look very confident in my photo? I might do hands on hips or, or crossing hands, hands across the chest. Um, if I want something that is, um, you know, maybe, uh, open, um, very relational, very, um, Hey, I'm a safe person to tell your problems to, or something, you know, I can do a, a different pose. I honestly, I, I, I keep coming back to this, and I'm sorry, but it's, it's really lock yourself in front of a mirror, put some music on, and just give yourself permission to experiment, okay? If you need to, you know, <laughs> put on Madonna and play Vogue and just pretend that, you know, you're back in the 80s and, and voguing and it's okay, um, do something that gives yourself permission to experiment a little bit. Um, the, the poses you play with are not the poses you have to use. 
So the way I will translate this for writers is if you've ever written the scene that you knew was over the top, you knew this was not going to work, but you needed to write it to figure out what would work. That's what we're doing when you lock yourself in the bathroom and you do the crazy poses, okay? And you'll find most of them aren't crazy. They're crazy. They feel crazy because you're not used to doing it, okay? Um, so as far as if I want to do the, um, let, me, let me back up. Um, first of all, let me jump back here. If you look at this model, I don't think this is a particularly sexy come on pose. I think what she looks is feminine. She doesn't look sexy. And there's a distinct difference there. Um, and I'm totally fine if you, un if you don't want to come across as sexy, then don't, don't think that I'm telling you that that's what you have to do. Um, what I'm saying is uh, present yourself in the, in the way that you want to feel comfortable. Um, that's still presenting your, your brand. Um, so that, that would be, <laughs> this is a very long way of saying, experiment with some poses. And again, I'm happy to work with you on Saturday. A lot of times this is stuff that's much easier. If I'm seeing somebody move in person, I can work with the movement that is natural for that person. Whereas if I'm looking at some type on a screen, it's really hard for me to say, oh, and this will look good on you um, because I don't know how you move. So um, absolutely pull me out on Saturday and we'll work with your natural movement to get a pose that's natural, comfortable, and what you want. So um, I, hope that's a, I hope that's an acceptable response. <laughs> so, okay. Um, there you can get a lot of different moves. This is um, a friend of mine's, uh, this is obviously another costume um, photo, um, but what I like about this is you can get a lot of different feels just by putting your hands in different place. Um, she's playing with a very specific character here. You don't need to go that over the top with characterization, but you can, and if you look at this, you can see a number of different moods here and all she's done is move her arms. Okay, so this is where you, again, you look in the bathroom mirror and you experiment with crossing your arms, you experiment with doing the classic, um, the obligatory uh, slight head tilt with the hand on your chin, uh, you know, author photo or whatever. Play with all of those and find the one that feels best for, again, for the brand you're trying to convey. Um, and the same thing again, I'm, at this point, I'm blatantly pulling costume photos because the nice thing about costume photos is they are intensely character oriented. And um, so they, they uh, again, it's, it's the writing, the over the top scene that you're gonna edit down into the workable scene. Um, and so that's what I like to do with, uh, with costume photos is find some things, and you can do this with uh, photos in magazines or, or, or uh, illustrations, uh, graphic novels, whatever, find something you're like, man, I wanna do that. And then tone it down so it looks good on you in real life when you're not a graphic novel character. Okay. So this would be normally where we would all stand up and move around. So what I want you to do right now is if you have either your webcam or your, um, or a mirror nearby or something is um, play, in a, play for a second with, you know, go, go stick your face in the mirror or in your webcam, play a little bit with the turtle and try a few expressions on. So, um, you can, you know, look, give, give me, give yourself the serious face, give yourself the smile, give yourself the, the knowing smile that's not quite a smile, give yourself the, hey, I'm having a great time, grin, experiment with these um, and find out which one you like best um, in your, on your own face, and which one do you think presents your brand the best. Um, those may not be the same thing, okay? I don't know your brand, you're going to have to think about that. Um, all of these are, of course, depending on the fact, you know, whether you have to have a great book in order to market it well. Um, if your book's not ready for market, the best author photo in the world won't sell it. Okay. Um, so obviously you guys know this. Um, I just like to reiterate it anytime I talk about marketing. It's easier to sell a great book than it is a mediocre book. So, um, back over here. All right. Um, I'll come back and see you guys. Um, this is where I want to kind of open it up for questions. Um, again, 
and my original intent was that we would do this live and everybody would get a chance to, to practice this um, and we could get some one-on-one -on -one, um, movement and feedback. And, um, and actually when I do this, I do teach um, posing for characterization um, with, the, uh, with the, the costumes and such. And we frequently have a photographer in there working so you can see how moving slightly um, over here will make a huge difference in the camera over there. One thing that's important to keep in mind is uh, cameras foreshorten. And again, um, the, taking a three-dimensional object and flattening it into a two-dimensional object. So um, camera distance and the kind of lens will make a huge difference. You can be the, the same person in the same pose in the same lighting. And by moving the camera or by using a different length of lens, you can get a completely different um, photo more or less flattering or whatever um, out of that so that's why that's that's the stuff that happens on the photographer end but if I have a great photographer but a person who's just like yeah take my picture um, <laughs> then th that's really hard they can't make a great photo out of that either so um, if anybody has questions uh, to throw on the screen I will wait a moment to see if any of those pop up um, otherwise your homework is to practice and then Saturday um, definitely grab me if you don't have something that you're really comfortable with yet. Um, definitely grab me and we can practice. I will also tell you that the photographers we have on Saturday are really good. And if you tell them what I'm going for, you know, I would like something that feels a little bit mysterious or I want something that feels very open and honest. Um, these people are really good at coaching and they will help you to get that as well. But do your homework in advance. So um, do you have any questions? Sorry, I'm going to grab a drink. Okay. I'm not seeing any photos, or I'm sorry, I'm not seeing any questions pop up. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this. This will be uh, saved. And um, if you have, uh, like I said, if, if you want to practice, grab me on Saturday. Um, and I would be more than happy to take you aside and we can move and it's so much easier for me to find comfortable poses for people when I see how people are already moving um, it's really hard for me to say I don't know you but why don't you stand like this because <laughs> you know, um, that's the difference what you can do um, is you can find out which which um, you know view do I want to present to the camera which um, what is the mood that I want to present to the camera what is the genre that I want my photos to illustrate and that's the kind of thing. So, okay. Um, all right. So we got some thank yous. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this is helpful. Again, if you guys have questions, definitely contact me. Um, and otherwise, we will see. Um, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on. I, my eyes are so weird. Like I can see certain distances, but not others. So I'm always transitioning back and forth. I apologize. Oh, um, somebody who didn't sign up for makeup. Um, the bare minimum that I consider for, for makeup. Um, and if you just want to take the shine off, get a uh, translucent powder. Um, so on, honestly, the, well, the makeup artist that we have on site will probably be able to, to lend you some, so don't go buy anything or whatever. You want something that's going to match your face tone. Um, so if you have the wrong, tone, wrong color of makeup on, it can make you look undead. That's not good. <laughs> so make sure you get the right one. Um, but something to even out skin tone and take this um, something to highlight the eyes a little bit. Um, that can be uh, eyeliner or mascara, or it can, it can be very subtle. Um, that I know lots of guys too who wear um, a very very subtle um, eyeliner or mascara when they're doing uh, photography. If for the most part, if it looks like you can see it, it's you're you're doing it wrong. That's too much. Um, but if it's noticeable, but what that does is that when the camera flattens that, that image and blurs things, no, it doesn't blur them, but um, compresses, um, it just gives the eyes a little bit of definition there. So um, that's something you can use. And then uh, something to take the shine off, and that's where there's the translucent powder. Loose powder, as a general rule, is better than uh, the compressed powder, the little com powder compacts that you you buy those are great for touch-ups on the run um, but it's easy to get those on too thick and um, the again the rule of thumb is if I can see the makeup it's too much now obviously there are exceptions to that if I'm doing my my gaudy you know I like to have fun with my eye makeup and obviously purple is not a 
skin color found in nature. So um, that, that is going to show. But if it looks like there's makeup on my skin, um, I'm probably wearing too much or the wrong kind. If you have a Sephora near you, Sephora is, there's a lot of great makeup stores. Sephora might be my, one of my favorites. Um, and I'm giving them a special shout out because they did donate some stuff to our uh, makeup artists this weekend when our original artists flaked um, and we were assembling some replacements artists and Sephora was kind enough to, to donate some foundations to us. So I was um, giving them a special shout out. They are one of my favorite stores anyway. Just walk in and say, hey, I'm going to be taking photos. I want something to take the shine off. Can you give me a powder that matches my skin? They'll give you a sample and you can, that, is, that sample will be completely enough to get you through, you know, the weekend and probably several weekends. So you don't need to spend um, money, money on it. So. Okay. Oh, uh, suggestions on clothing um, and holding objects and those kinds of things. Those are great questions. Um, so, you want clothing should definitely reflect your brand. Um, so, if I'm, uh, you saw my my pictures. I was wearing just a, um, I had a shirt that was just a simple plain um, fitted button down shirt in a solid color, and then I also had my, my jacket with the spikes and the buckles and it's very, very goth and very, um, very urban fantasy. So um, I've got two sets of photos there that I can use for different kinds of uh, events. So if I need to be a little edgier for one event, that's where I use the spiky black jacket. And if I need to use, um, need to something where I'm like, oh, I'm presenting at a school, um, <laughs> that'll be the solid, solid color button down. Excuse me. So it means if you want to do your, uh, your photo session with a layer that you can bring on and off and maybe get a couple of different looks, um, go ahead and grab that. Um, move around in the clothing that you will be photographing in because uh, many of us move differently depending on what we're wearing. So make sure that you're comfortable moving and posing in whatever it is that you're lo looking to photograph in. Um, as far as objects, um, you want to... The big problem I see is people often limit the use of their photos. So if I've got, I've got a stack of books holding my microphone up right here, <laughs> but if I'm you know, one of them, uh, if I've got a book, I'm like, this is my author photo. Okay. I've now limited it and it's really only good for promoting this book. Okay. And anything I slap it on later, it's going to look a little dated um, because I'm promoting this book during it. Okay. Um, but if, if I'm holding an object that's going to be relevant to my entire series or my entire brand, my entire catalog of books, uh, that might be something. Now, uh, you want to avoid the cheese factor here. So um, Jim Butcher, the photo I showed you um, earlier, he's holding a dog and a sword. Um, th that is a great social media picture. I don't think that that would be what I would put on the book jacket, okay, because it's going to look... Uh, you know, he's trying too hard. He's on his book jacket with a sword, you know, kind of thing. I don't know. Um, but as a social media picture, it works great. Um, so I guess if you're thinking about objects um, to bring into your photo, uh, think about how much use you're going to be able to get out of the photo with that particular object and what it will look like in different, um, in different scenarios. And again, you're taking home a number of photos out of this. So get some with and without. Get some with different outer layers on. So, um, you know, you're doing a whole session and you'll get a number of photos to take home. So, all right. Um, I think that looks like all of the, all of the questions. Um, I don't see any additional ones coming up. So thank you guys very much. Thanks for sticking around through our technical difficulties earlier. And I will see you, and I see a number of people saying, I will be asking you help on Saturday. Absolutely. If, if I'm, I will uh, make myself available, just um, catch me when I'm not, actively stumping out a fire or something. So, okay. I will see you guys on Saturday. Thank you very much. Have a great night.